Turn with me now to Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. That's on page 856. 856. After they were gone, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death, so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, There's a sermon outline there in your newsletters, and depending on how we go, there'll be an opportunity for question time at the end. Uh, During Advent, let me remind you, we've been working our way uh, through Matthew's description of the events leading up to the first Christmas, Jesus' birth. Uh, In this four-week period in the church calendar, God's people are waiting and looking for an arrival. Uh, For us today, that means we can look backwards a long way and look at what happened at the first Christmas and back even further, but we can also look forwards and think about the return of Jesus and how to get ready for that day. Uh, As Matthew has done this, he's made four references to the Old Testament to explain events, and we're up to the third of those today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for its clarity. Thank you for its practicality. Thank you that it's the expression of your very nature. Our Father, in these three verses, help us to see what Jesus is and how magnificent your passion for your people is. In Jesus' name, amen. That point one on the outline is really only a small section uh, of Jesus' birth narrative. It's Scary. I'd hate to have such a dream and have to bundle up my family, but it's also deceptively simple. The wise men have visited, the wise men have worshipped, the wise men have been warned, the wise men leave. Their timing suggests, and you'll find this out a little more next week as Dan takes us into the last section, their timing suggests that Jesus is somewhere between one and two years old. He's a toddler. Uh, If you like, they've stayed at the grandparents' place for a little after the birth, hanging in Joseph's hometown. At the same time, Herod's scheming because he's received the same details. Next week, you'll see the horrific outcome of that, but he desires to find the boy and to do him harm. That night, at least that's the way the narrative works, that night after the wise men have left and the family has gone to bed, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph. The instruction is very clear there, isn't it? Get up, get the family, get out of here. Get up, get the family, get out of here. Herod wants to wipe your boy from the face of the earth. That's literally what Herod wants to do. No memory of this child. So get up, get your family, get out of here. Joseph is just one of those great unsung heroes of the Christmas narrative, isn't he? Uh, What does he do? I need to get a coffee? No. I I need a few more sleeps? Don't you know what it's like having a newborn? He gets up, he gets his family, and he gets out of there straight away. Uh, Joseph has a track record of taking God at his word, doesn't he? Consistently throughout the account of Jesus' birth. They stay in Egypt until Herod dies. Now, it's a really simple account, isn't it? Uh, you could be mistaken for thinking that it was a gap filler, as if Matthew's editor says, uh, we need a, a little more racy here, please. Uh, you could be encouraged to apply it badly. I've heard too many people apply this passage by saying Jesus was a refugee. I don't think that's Matthew's point. You might even have skipped over it so many times that you'd forgotten it's there. You want to get from the wise men to the gruesome stuff we'll look at next week. Matthew doesn't do that, does he? Uh, And we get a very clear hint that he views this in very serious terms by what he does in verse 15. He stayed there until Herod's death so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. Uh, And Matthew has applied the Old Testament to some really big events. 
the angel coming to Joseph, the wise man, as we'll see next week, the slaughter of the two-year-olds. Why would he do it with this event? Why would he say that these three verses need a massive explanation by going all the way back to the Old Testament? Something important is happening, something really significant. And Matthew returns to a formula that he uses ten times in his biography. He's already used it to describe the angel visiting Joseph. Uh, He'll use it in the next passage from Jeremiah 31. He's not talking about a predictive prophecy, this is going to take place. Uh, He's doing what we call typological prophecy. There's a pattern here and you need to be aware of the pattern. The pattern of what God is doing right across history and when it gets to this point we've got the same pattern but we've got a massive escalation. It's really big. It's huge what we're about to see and what we're about to see I think is a glimpse of who Jesus really is, this little boy. This one to two-year-old child who has had to flee. I point two on the outline and you'll see there three patterns that I've highlighted. Uh, As we read Matthew's account, we've got to remember he's writing from a particular perspective. Remember we're going through Matthew over seven or eight years, just like we're doing Genesis. Remember uh, when we looked at Matthew 9, we remembered he was a Jew. He's one of Abraham's mob. He's an outsider at that point because he's collecting taxes. But he's a Jew from the family of Abraham, the family that God said God would use to save the world. He's a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes that came from Jacob's family. That nation, that nation is defined by a number of really big events, really significant moments that shape who they are, perhaps none more significant than the Exodus. In fact, there's a whole book of the Bible named after it. You can read about it in the first five books of the Bible, in the build-up and then the event and everything that goes around it. We're getting to a key point in our series in Genesis, aren't we now? Joseph's in Egypt. Abraham's family ended up in Egypt through a series of events that God had described. God described them in Genesis 15. And there in say for many years, God rescued them, didn't he? You remember how each Easter on the Thursday night we sit on the front lawn? and we have that lamb and flatbread, we're remembering the same stuff. A series of amazing events that said to Egypt and the whole world, look at God, he's got no rival. And God appointed a leader at that time for his people. Can anyone remember his name to lead them out? It was Moses, wasn't it? Thanks, Max. Moses has a unique description in the Bible. In Exodus 33, verse 11, Moses is described as the man God talked to face to face. Like you would a friend. No other person in the Bible is described like that. A friend of God who talked with God face to face. Under the leadership of Moses, God's mob, which is now a massive community of well over a million, are saved from generations of slavery through God's actions alone. And God grabs them and pulls them out of Egypt and takes them to a mountain and he says, you're my people, Exodus 19 to 20. You can read it there. God saves them and then he makes them his people. And they come into a binding agreement there, a covenant. God gives them a very clear job in Exodus 19, 1 to 8. Your job is to show God to the world. Uh, let me give you a very clear job description for that. What's the clear job description to do that? It's the Ten Commandments. Now you've got to get that order straight. God saves them, God makes them, then God gives them the commandments. They're already saved by that point. And the commandments are given so they have a clear outline of behaviour to show God to the world. When they live like this, the whole world will look at them and go, their God is unique. And then God takes them from there and in a matter of days he takes them. No, he doesn't, does he? Because God promised them a land and it wasn't a matter of days, it was a matter of decades. Because what did God's people reveal about their nature? They were stubborn. They were sinful. They were hard-hearted. They were proud and arrogant and persistently disobedient. 
Even Moses, the friend of God, showed the same nature to the point where not even Moses got into that lovely land that God promised. So when Matthew references Egypt in verse 15, as a reader, you're meant to remember all of that because that's the defining moment of your nation. You go back to Egypt and you think of all of those things that took place. In fact, when you step back a little further from Matthew 1 and 2, you step back and go, there's a lot of similarities here between Moses and Jesus. Just like Moses, Jesus was born when there was an oppressive rule over God's mob. Just like Moses, the life of Jesus was threatened by law from the leader. Just like Moses, the ruler at the time of Jesus killed many infant boys from God's mob. Just like Moses, Jesus fled for his life. Just like Moses, Jesus was identified by God as the one to lead the salvation of his people. Just like Moses, but Jesus is far greater, isn't he? Remember what we heard about Jesus in Matthew 1.21? Jesus isn't going to save his people from one patch of dirt to another patch of dirt. Jesus isn't going to save his people from whips and guns and jail and take them into a land that is green and pastoral. Jesus is going to take his people from eternal condemnation to hell and deliver them into the presence of God forever. Jesus is just like Moses, but greater. Moses was God's friend. Jesus is God's son. And he'll bring a delivery that is far more marvellous. But Matthew wants us to go a little deeper. He wants us to go a little deeper here than just a greater Moses. I think Matthew actually wants us to go, Jesus was greater than Moses. In fact, Jesus was everything that God wanted his people to be and they never were. He takes us back to Hosea. Hosea was a bloke who spoke God's word to God's mob around 755 BC, 722 BC over roughly a 30-year period. Uh, it was a rough time for God's people. It split into two nations, and Hosea works in that group up the north called Israel, not down near Jerusalem. So he's not like Isaiah and Micah. Similar time, but he's up the top. And in that reading that we had from Hosea 11, I hope you noticed how passionate God was for his people. We're going to come to that in a moment. But there was a comment there in verse 7 of Hosea 11. God is unbelievably committed to his mob, yet they are bent on turning away from me. They are bent on turning away from me. In fact, God's mob at the time of Hosea just had to look at Hosea's home life to see what was going on. When Hosea was appointed a prophet, God gave him a clear instruction, go and meet Gomer the prostitute and marry her. And when you marry her, she will be habitually, persistently and constantly unfaithful. You will have to go and buy her back again and again, Hosea, and all of God's people, you watch that and that's like you are with me. I'm Hosea, you're Gomer. And Hosea is just wondrously gracious. He never leaves Gomer. He never neglects her. He never turns his back on her. He never breaks trust with her, even as she daily breaks trust with him. God's mob are just like Gomer. And that's why they fail in their primary role. Remember their job? What was the job of God's mob from Exodus 19? Show God to the world. (laughs) Show God to the world. You are to represent me to the world so the whole world will know God's true nature. How did Israel do at that? They failed dismally. 
In fact, it was nothing new because every human being has failed in that. Whose image were humans made in? You see, that's one of the wonders of Genesis 1 and 2. Every human is made in the image of God. So every human should represent God to the universe. And how do humans do it that? How did Israel do it that? God is so persistent, like Hosea with Gomer, but greater. He persists through the sin of all humanity. He persists through the rebellion of all Israel. He persists so he sends his one boy to do the job that every human and all Israel have failed to do. What was that job? To represent God to the whole universe. I I think Matthew wants us to grasp this at this point, to see that the life of Jesus doesn't just mirror the life of Moses. It mirrors the life of all of God's people, all humanity, but it's greater. By connecting Jesus to those significant moments in the history of God's mob, by connecting Jesus to this famous statement about how much God loves his people, Matthew is saying Jesus represents perfectly. He shows God to the world perfectly in a way that no human has ever done and Israel certainly didn't do. But there's a little twist here, isn't there? Because Jesus does it as a human. He's born. He's got nappies. He needs feeding. He grows up. He goes to school. He gets a trade. He works as a carpenter. He is truly human in the flesh. And so as Jesus represents God to the world perfectly, at the same time he represents humans to God perfectly. He's the perfect representative of God to humans and of humans to God. And Matthew wants us to get this. But he goes even deeper. He goes even deeper. As Matthew shows the Lord protecting his son, as Matthew shows the Lord protecting his promised saviour, Matthew wants us to grasp the pattern of God's passion. Now turn with me to Hosea, page 804. Turn with me to Hosea, page 804. Hosea 11, 1 to 11. This is the first scripture passage I ever memorised. It's a wondrous passage, isn't it? You need to grasp the emotion here. Oh, we're scared of talking about God and emotion, aren't we? Uh, we're, we're worried that we'll put a theological foot wrong. But you can't read Hosea 11, 1 to 11, and not meet the emotion of God, can you? Uh, just look through that passage and see the passion of God. A father calling his boy when his boy is in deep trouble. A father calling his boy because he has a deep, deep love for his boy. A a father who takes his boy and shows him how to walk, who wraps him in his arms and leads him with gentle kindness, tending his feet and putting them in the right spot. A father who then stoops down to his boy's height to feed him. A father who is rightly furious, white hot, at his son's persistent disobedience. A father who rightly judges his wayward boy. A father whose internal conversation in verse 8 we actually see, we, we kind of go into this conversation within God uh, where he is racked with deep compassion as his son abuses this affection that is lavished upon him. A father who restrains that white-hot fury at his son's rebellion because he loves him too much. A father who will rightly judge his boy, but who will lavish love on him so that he is fully restored. How passionate is God? How zealous and burning is God for his beloved son? Are you ever astounded at the passion of God for you? Are you ever dumbstruck 
at the persistent, passionate grace of God for people like us. It doesn't overlook reality, does it? That's one of the wondrous things about Hosea 11. God doesn't brush it all under the carpet or pay the best global lawyer to get his son out of trouble. God doesn't whitewash it or ignore the truth of the sin in his people. It doesn't water down the love of God. God is passionately committed to his people when his people are passionately committed to rebellion. God is so passionately committed to his people that he sends his one and only boy to bear that white-hot fury for his people. That white-hot fury at sin for his people is poured out on God's boy, the very boy that God calls out of Egypt. Uh, it's really a simple event. I'm at the last point on the outline. Uh, it's easy to skip over, isn't it? It's scary. I'd hate to have lived through it. I think Joseph is wonderfully manly, if you like, in leading his family in such a godly way. Uh, it's, it's a simple event in Jesus' early childhood, but it brings us face to face with three patterns of God that show the nature of Jesus, the pattern of people, the pattern of representation, the pattern of God's passion. Uh, in those patterns, Jesus is the greater Moses. He's not just God's friend, but he's God himself come to rescue his people. In those patterns, Jesus is the perfect representative of God to the world, of humans to God. In those patterns, Jesus is the pinnacle of the passion and compassion of God upon our stubbornly rebellious people. So what are we going to do with it? What do do we do with that? I've got three suggestions there on your outline. I've got to admit I haven't quite thought through what these look like. Uh, But let let me encourage you to think through these three applications. Jesus is coming again. There is a movement in history. But the climax has already come. We already know the end point, don't we? In the resurrection of Jesus, in his life, death and resurrection, we have the eternal outcome already given. In fact, we have all of history fulfilled. Everything Israel never was, everything every human never was there in Jesus. Please be aware of that. Second, the sufficiency of Jesus should never be doubted. He is fully God, God's boy, (laughs) God's son come to represent God himself to the world and he does it sufficiently. But he's also Joseph's boy, isn't he? Born of Mary, fully human, just like us, but perfect. So he represents us to God. Jesus is enough. There is nothing deficient or lacking in who or what Jesus is and does. Can I encourage you, don't try to supplement Jesus by going back to all those good laws that Jesus has already fulfilled. (laughs) We don't ignore them. We don't dispose of them. We might turn to them as Jesus encourages us to and so does Paul to learn how to represent him to the world, but they don't make up for any deficiency in Jesus, do they? There is no need to shore up the work of Jesus by our own works. Third, can I plead with you to be grabbed by the passion of God? How passionate is God with his grace? That eternal angst he seems to express in Hosea 11, that yearning, that desire, that fury at sin, that love for sinners, that compassion. As we heard in Isaiah 9 last night, the zeal of the Lord accomplishes this. Please be assured that if you are one of God's people today, that is the passion that is pursuing you. That is how passionate God is for his mob. There is no sin committed by humanity that cannot be defeated 
by the love of God in Jesus Christ. No wrath from God that cannot be turned aside by that boy who fled into Egypt and died on the cross. This is the God who is so passionate that he sent his son to save the world. Please be grabbed by it. Let me pray. Father, it's a strange little passage, perhaps a strange little sermon, but please help us to be grabbed by these patterns, the pattern of the greater Moses, your son in the flesh, the pattern of perfect representation, Jesus, who shows you fully and shows us fully, uh, your unbelievably passionate grace that pursues your rebellious people. Father, when so many things are tugging at us and grabbing us, please grab us with this so that we know Jesus as he truly is, so that we display him as he really is. In his name we pray. Amen.